Uh, my name is Angela Wilson. I am a writer, a mother, a grandmother, a performer, a teacher, an advocate. Um, yeah. My life, I grew up on a farm in Idaho um, as a farm girl. Uh, you showed horses and pigs in 4-H. Um, yeah, and then um, uh, my grandfather made homemade corn whiskey. And I started, uh, you know, dipping into it when I was about nine. Um, some uh, tragic, what felt very tragic at the time, my parents got divorced. Um, I found out that my father adopted me, that he wasn't really my, f I mean, he's my dad, but, you know, when you're a teenager um, and your hormones are going crazy and you're moving away from your farm and the world. you know, dibbling and dabbling in the, in the marijuana and the acid and the mushrooms. But most of all, um, I was drinking to excess. My mother was raised by, um, by the nuns in an all-girl Catholic school because her uh, parents were alcoholics. Um, She would, uh, she would let me, I, I ran everything. I could do whatever I wanted and no one was really paying attention. And then when my parents got divorced, my mom was doing like divorcee stuff. And so basically, you know, just no one was paying attention. Um, and so I was exploring, you know, sexuality. I was exploring, you know, drugs and that sort of thing. And there wasn't really, she wasn't around enough to, because she was working so hard. Um, that she, you know, she wasn't around enough to, um, to guide me because I'm the, I, you know, I'm the kind of girl that needs a foot on her neck because I'm pretty, got some pretty wild blood in me. There was also some, a lot of sexual violence against me um, that really uh, shaped the way that things happened. Um, and in her permissions, I said promiscuous, you can't be promiscuous with your mom. Um, but she was uh, permissive. Um, so she let me leave home at 16 with a 55 year old man. And so um, I was also allowed to, um, I had a uh, fake ID when I was 16 years old and I was allowed to go in the bar and bring grown men home. Um, and so no one was taking, no one was guiding me, um, and no one was protecting me. You know, we have to protect the girl children, and so, um, and so these things happen. And strangely enough, it just in the last, I don't know, maybe five or six years, that I really realized what a predator, you know, I just, I didn't... He had a look in his eye and I've seen that look and I knew that he was going to try to harm me or kill me or something and so um, I held him hostage with a gun uh, and I'll just leave that there uh, and um, escaped and then I was dropped off at the only person I knew was a Hells Angels house um, and so sadly I essentially belonged to them for a very long time um, and I was working in a strip joint by the time I was 17 years old. And so you can just imagine, um, you know, the, what a horror story this is. I, I moved and stayed um, away from the methamphetamine because by then I was a meth addict. Um, and so I, I stayed sober uh, while I was pregnant and then I had my son, the only child I've ever had. Um, and eventually, because I'm an addict, uh, and I, no one ever used that language with me before, and I didn't know that, and so I began to drink again. Um, no one had told me about AA. And um, 
And so eventually I uh, uh, called my mother and she came and got my son. And then I decided to be a junkie and uh, shoot heroin and methamphetamine and live down in the Tenderloin and be stalked by a Hell's Angel guy. And, you know, there's a lot of horror story in there, too. That So uh, that's the beginning of my little life. <laughs> So I was incarcerated, uh, mostly, so I was really good. So this is before the internet. Um, so I was really good at making checks and going in the banks and uh, cashing them. I used to be really, really good at it. Uh, so fraud, um, residential burglary, um, mostly fraud, yeah. So I did the, on the installment plan for about six years. So I go in for, you know, six months, eight months, get back out, la, 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 shoot some more dope, go back to jail. Yeah. Um. And I met uh, Rodessa Jones from the Medea Project Theater for Incarcerated Women while I was at CJ, what is CJ8, what was CJ8, CJ2 now. Um, and while I was incarcerated there, I met her. And so in the Medea Project, it's about a four to six month rehearsal with professional um, actors, dancers, social workers. Um, <clears throat> there's a beautiful film on it. Uh, it's called We Just Tellin' Stories. Uh, when I met her, uh, we would be, uh, f the show was at the Lorraine Hansberry Theater and we would get shackled and handcuffed and go there for a tw two week run. And then um, after that show was over, I chose to go to Walden House, which is now Health Right 360. And so I went to Walden House and I graduated. I stayed in program for about two and a half years. That was available at that time. Um, ended up working for them and really changed my life. Uh, I'm still part of the Medea Project Theater for Incarcerated Women. Um, got back in contact, found my mom, found my son. You know, My father had disowned me and we've worked this out. One of the things about changing, saving your own life or changing it, you know, my son came to live with me. I was learning how to be in the world. I had never taken care of myself in, in, in a healthy, uh, grown-up way and paid rent and did all those things. So, you know, now I'm 55 and I want to retire and I need that little piece of paper. Um, because, and, and the other thing is, you know, I make really good money and so... Um, and I've always had a vision of having a, you know, a higher education, but uh, I just needed to grow some more and be able to do that. My son's grown, I, you know, I bought my house, I, I, I'm ready to retire, so I'm coming back. Part of me wishes I would have done this earlier, but the other part is like I'm really, really uh, res more responsible now, I think. Um, Well, Miss Doris, I mean, my goodness, what a cheerleader. Like, she's the greatest cheerleader. Just thinking about her makes me want to cry. She's a great cheerleader. And I was like, you know, one of the things about getting a higher education is it's incredibly expensive, stupid expensive. And I own, I have a lot, I own a home. And so they can take your stuff. They can, you know, there's a lot of ways that this kind of debt could damage it. And she's like, you're going to school. She sat down and she helped me like count every little piece of credit and, you know, we'll do this and we got that and you're going to school and, you know, when I, the first week I was here, I got really emotional because I'm the first, uh, I'm the first girl in my bloodline that has ever went to a uh, university. Um, and, you know, I've taught at university a lot because Ms. Rodessa Jones from the Medea Project has schlepped me around the country. You know, Rutgers, Hamilton, you, I've, I've, I've taught and performed here, you know, and I always like, oh, I wish I could be that girl, but I just, you know, I can't because I have this, this, and this. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm really emotional the first week. And so Ms. Doris was really, really, you know, loving and helpful and, yeah, she's a great cheerleader. She's, uh, she just keeps me going, really. <laughs> Sorry. She's a serious cheerleader. Um, I don't see myself being allowed not to uh, complete it. Not that I, I'll do it on my own, but she's definitely doing this. Um, I 
I don't suffer this. I don't care what people think about me being formerly incarcerated. Um, I don't walk with my head down. I have zero guilt or zero shame. That hasn't always been true. I've done a lot of healing. Um, and I have information other people don't have. Um, I've lived through things that would kill most people. Uh, they're just not me. Um, and so, you know, people study and they read these books, but they don't know what I know. Um, and that's my superpower. I work for the San Francisco Sheriff's Department. I've worked there for 25 years. I'm currently working at the Women's Resource Center, so I'm the supervisor at the Women's Resource Center. So uh, the Women's Resource Center is this really beautiful space. You don't have to be formally incarcerated to be there. That's what it was designed for, but we've opened it. It's for uh, all humans that identify as women. Uh, we go in the jail as well and do a couple groups over there so the women know that we're here or there at the Women's Resource Center and with the trans women as well. We love trans women. So, uh, yeah. Historically, that space was like, you know, a free for all. You could come gout out or shitty drunk or just come and do it. So we don't do that there anymore. <laughs> um, I created a space that's safe for women, um, that's safe for all women. And it's a beautiful thing and it really works itself out. And women tell me all the time how safe and happy they are. And, and you know, you couldn't tell me anything more profound than that. So when a woman tells you they feel safe, that's all you need. How often do we feel safe? Uh, most of the women that come there are living in abstinence. It's not a requirement, but uh, in, in, interestingly enough, energetically, it's pushed out people who are, are using um, because they're just not comfortable there uh, because we're all like on fire to change our lives. Women are getting their children back, you know, getting an education. Uh, you know, we write goal sheets and do... We own uh, anger management curriculum. Uh, and women are changing their lives. The place is on fire. Um, if I die tomorrow, like I, my work is done. I have, I'm, I'm incredibly proud of that space. Uh, yeah. I hope that they can turn that trauma into power. I hope that they can forgive themselves. I hope that they can like themselves. I hope they can love themselves. I hope that they can hug and kiss their children. I hope that they can have a healthy relationship with someone. They can be loved the way they deserve to be loved. That they can always feel safe. Um, I hope they get a PhD and a house. I hope that they get whatever they want. That's what I hope for them. And I hope that they understand how beautiful and powerful and delicious they are. Um, and I hope that when they look at me that they know that anything is possible because I'm coming for everything that they said I couldn't have. The, one of the sad parts about having this life that I just told you all about is uh, how it affects the children. My son specifically. But I got this grandson. And I get to redeem myself. And we both think that we're the greatest thing that ever happened. I was there when he was born. And, uh, I find a lot of pride in being his grandmother, his healthy grandmother. He always has a place to call home. I actually changed a lot of things about myself when he was born. There was another level of work, healing that I did so I could be uh, his grandma.
<laughs> so what do I hope to do? Well, I'm going to get this piece of paper. <laughs> and I'm going to be a consultant uh, on how to develop and implement programs for incarcerated people. And I will travel around the country, perhaps the world. I am also um, getting my theater master's degree, might get the MFA, probably get a PhD. Um, but I will, my business will also include mo moving uh, trauma through women's bodies um, as art, as, act as, art, as social activism. Uh, the great Rodessa Jones is allowing me to utilize her Medea methodology. And then I will add my own Angie twist. And I, be I believe that I'll continue to be happy. And then I'll continue to heal. And then I'll continue to be a voice for women. Humans, but mostly women. Um, and then I'll continue to be loud and uh, rageful <laughs> and clear and concise. And yeah, and I'll continue just to love that love me. That's what I'll do.